I was a staff member at the uh, International Headquarters of Scientology from 1990 until 2005 when I left. During my 15 years at working at the Scientology headquarters, I witnessed and uh, was exposed to many things that I'll never, ever um, be able to erase from my mind. And um, just to give you some examples, um, for the entire 15 years that I worked there, I averaged at least one ho 100 hours a week work hours. We would literally, any waking hour was spent working, and that's pretty much the hours that every single person there uh, worked. We did very little else besides that. When I left in 2005, I was averaging three to four hours sleep a night. And in some weeks, I was putting in over 130 hour, hours a week working. We was, sometimes we'd stay up for three or four nights in a row to get a project done. And this would be anywhere from 20 to 50 to 100 people that had to stay through the night, night after night after night after night. But the reason I wanted to leave was because the sleep deprivation was killing me. I wasn't being allowed to visit my family. Uh, I wasn't getting paid for my work. And I said, look, this is abusive. I can't do this. I mean, physically, I couldn't do it anymore. Were you part of the C organization? Yeah, for eight years. I see. And how much were you paid a week? It varies. There are some times I wasn't paid at all because they didn't have enough money. There are some times I was paid half pay because I was in trouble. But what is Half pay is 25 bucks. So full pay would be 50, 50, 50 dollars a week. That means something like seven dollars a day. Yeah. I and I was getting five hours of sleep, so the amount of hours I was working. So what kind of hours did you work in the in the day? Or? I'd start at eight in the morning till eleven at night. Good lord. That was six days a week. And on the Sunday, we were allowed a few hours off in the morning to do laundry. Right. And that was the only time we had off. So for doing all them hours, you must have made a lot of money for yourself. I should have done, but I was on about we were on, on about twelve pounds a week. I worked, you know, fifteen hours a day. We worked seven days a week. I maybe had two or three days off a year. Astra says disobedience wasn't tolerated in the Sea Org. She says once she refused an order from a higher-ranking Sea Org member, and he held me up against a wall, screaming in my face. They work hundred-hour weeks seven days a week they have no breaks they have no vacations of any kind uh, they work round the clock they have no private time uh, they're paid about forty cents an hour um, and then they're subjected to uh, all kinds of uh, punishments and uh, abuse um, the only these are policies all have has written if you leave this year you're a degraded being the only reason you leave is because of your own withholds and the, your own crimes and you'd wear people down you have to get them to go into confessionals and admit what they've done read the policies saying that they're wrong tell them yell at them um, as soon as you say you want to leave you're put on to hard labor Please. I wanted more than anything to say by all means go and take me with you <laughs> why didn't you because <laughs> I get in such big trouble because if I just up and left, my family would never speak to me again. My mom, my grandma, my brother. So I wasn't about to do that. If I sided. Why did she stop talking to you? Because um, my sister's still in. All of my family, my aunts, my uncles, my grandma. So she would have to choose between me or the entire rest of her family. So that's a hard decision to make. Yes, but what was the reason that she doesn't talk to you anymore? What was your crime? Because I was declared a suppressive person because in October, uh, when was it, 2006, I left the church and I didn't want to go back. Once you're declared a suppressive person, you can no longer speak with any of your family if they are involved in Scientology whatsoever. You cannot speak to any friends. Anybody involved in Scientology, you have no further communication with, period, ever again, ever. When I left Scientology in 2005, the fam my family members that were still in Scientology were all contacted before I could contact them and told never to communicate with me ever again. When I, le when I left in 2005, my mother 
was told never to speak to me again, and I hadn't even been able to tell her why I left or to even speak to her for one last time and say goodbye. All incoming mail and outgoing mail is read by security personnel. So if my mother were to write me a letter, it would be read by at least one security personnel before I would even get to it. If I wrote a letter to my mother, it would be read. I would, any mail that any staff member there mails out has to be sent unsealed so that it can be read by security. And once they've read it and deemed it proper and no, no uh, sensitive information is being leaked through the letter, or I'm not saying what's happening with me or that I'm unhappy or any non-optimum situation is written in the letter, if that's all okay, then the security guard themselves will seal it and then mail it. And then eventually I phoned my mom and asked her to send me, I think it was uh, $400 at the time, so I could get a plane fare home. And all the, the money that goes into the York, or any letters, are opened. And after so many weeks, I was still phoning my mum and said, I have not received this money. And she said, well, I sent it. You should have got it by now. So I went to the guy in charge of the letters. Right. And I said, no, I pretended it was just money for vitamins. I didn't say it was for a plane at home. Because they wouldn't have let me go home. They would have uh, standardly taken my passport off me yes. to keep me there. Right. But luckily, I didn't tell them I was leaving. And I kept my passport on me at all times. Right. I had a back pocket and I never took it out because I knew they would take it off me. Yes. And I went to the guy in charge of the letters and he said to me, Oh yeah, I got your letter two weeks ago. And the money was in it and I handed it to you. And I said, what do you mean you handed it to me? I would know if you handed me this money. <laughs> right, yes. And he said, that's what I did. All staff are required to surrender their passports and visas once signing up and starting work at the international headquarters. So if I'm a European citizen and I'm working there and I decide to leave, even if I do leave, I can't go anywhere because I don't have my passport or I don't have my visa. I don't have any of my papers and there's no way to get them. They're locked up in a safe. I have no access to them whatsoever. Staff that do manage to escape, after everything that I've just told you, staff that do manage to escape are hunted down like animals and recovered. Every morning, every, at, 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 every morning at breakfast, Every noon, every dinner time, and at the end of the night, there's a roll call of all staff members. They account for every single person. If at any one of those intervals someone is not accounted for, they call a drill. They check all bus stations, all airports, all hotels, any means of transport or, or escape are all checked and, and gone through to find any of these people, a person who might have left. Um, daily physical, verbal abuse, emotional abuse is, um, f f is just rampant throughout the uh, international headquarters of Scientology. People yelling at people, people punching people. I myself on at least ten different occasions have witnessed David Miscavige actually physically strike other staff members to the ground, um, strike staff members so many times or, or damage them physically that they actually needed medical attention. In one instance, um, I myself was punched several times by David Miscavige in the face. I personally was, was physically assaulted on four occasions by the leader of Scientology, David Miscavige. And one night I was in the basement just mopping the floor and my senior told me I wasn't mopping the floor right. I was leaving streaks on the floor and it got into an argument and he was a big guy, six foot four. And he ended up getting me in a headlock from behind and saying, I was trained in Australian police force and I know how to break a neck and I'm going to break your neck. And he was, he's a big strong guy and he was, I knew the, stri the force he was putting in, he would have broken my neck. I was at the ranch for about a year, yeah. And uh, when I tried to get out of there, when I was on the RPF program, that's when I was tackled. I got tackled by... Chris Geider, who's like an ex-professional rugby player, like I'm supposed to be able to <laughs> defend myself against that. Why did he tackle you? 
These I was trying to walk out. I said, look, I don't want to do this program. I want to see my family. I want to talk to somebody who's, you know, going to listen to what I have to say. And he wouldn't let me, he wouldn't let me walk out. He just grabbed me and stuck me in a car with another guy. I mean, they say you could just leave any time, but for me, uh, when I tried to leave, I was tackled. I was tackled by two very large men, and I couldn't leave, and I was brought back. And when I tried to leave again, I was again tackled, physically tackled. There was one time when I got my hand broken, and I got some a lot of bruises on my back, and that was uh, one of the times that I tried to run away, and I was stopped by um, another guy who was a ex, he's like an ex-bouncer before he got in Scientology or something, so I guess he was, he knew how to deal with, with people and that was to break their hands and shove them into bookcases.